Let's go. <laughs> this is the Hour of Awesome with Robert, Chris, and Steven. This isn't the hour of neat, cool, or rad. It is all going to be awesome. Okay, welcome to the Hour of Awesome. And he scrolls up on the show notes. The Bruce Willis Hour of Power, Episode 10. Uh, this is our second theme episode. Our first theme episode was our all Bruce Campbell episode. You know, hi, Bruce. And uh, today we will add our second fake listener, Bruce Willis, who we will now claim forevermore also listens to our show. Fake listener? Come on, man. You're underselling us here. Yeah, well, yeah, who knows? Maybe he'll be insane enough. I... I actually think it's more likely Bruce Willis will listen to us than Bruce Campbell. Although I prefer Bruce Campbell listening to us. That's just terrible. I think we're very popular within the Bruce crowds. We're going to get Box Lighter. We're going to get Greenwood. It's all going to just join up on us. Yeah. I think our most popular and most frequent listener will be Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee? <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. Okay. Uh, this is also our first video episode. So this is going to probably come across a little bit odd. Uh, we'll get better. Just like our audio podcast has gotten better, except for the last one, which I still apologize for. Oh, God, that was bad, especially my bit on coffee. Uh, hey, there's nowhere no, yeah. to go but up. <sighs> yeah. Sorry, Bruce. Yeah, that, was, that really was the worst episode that you've ever done, Robert, and you're an embarrassment to us all. We may have to just cut your picture out. Yeah. 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 My so. performance was just fine. Well, you guys were excellent <laughs> as always. <laughs> you were barely speaking by the end of that one there, man. You were just lost <laughs> in the middle. Well, like, what did I, I have to drink. say about whiskey and bourbon and... I don't know, whatever had Chris drunk and, and vodka your discussions of white wine. Yeah. It was unprofessional of me to get intoxicated during our show, but it happened anyway. No, it was. And nonetheless, it was actually <laughs> required of the actual <laughs> segment. So you were, you're were really, you know, method podcasting. Yep. That's absolutely. true. Okay. So I'm, I'm Robert Macy. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, and let's uh, go with Chris. Chris, introduce yourself. Happy 10th episode, folks. Yay. Tenth episodes, yeah. Look at that. We're still alive. Ten episodes in. Yep. And Steven. This person. Yeah, that's Steven over there. Me. Okay. You should vogue it. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Well, <laughs> this is the whole point of having this capability is we can do that. Yeah. Uh, so uh before it gets even worse, uh we'll go into uh super happy fun time, which we we've got no theme for. Um just start talking about Bruce right away and uh I'm going to lay this one on Steven. Go. Oh, I'm going to be defining Bruce or <laughs> Bruce's history. Wow, that's uh, straight, that's man. great that I'm in charge now suddenly. Aren't those your uh, notes? Apparently, to clarify, he was born Walter Bruce Willis in West Germany. Uh, that's a very long name. I wouldn't have included in West Germany as part of his name, but that's uh, part of his background. Um, military brat, as I understand, which is a nice little connection to all of his military roles that he's taken on. Um as everybody already knows, he is famous for a wide range of films, uh, TV. Of course, he started with Moonlighting. He got into uh, Die Hard, was a big break. Was uh, we'll, we'll spend some time having a conversation with that. Hearts War, Fifth Element, Hudson Hawk, Looper, and other modern day things that he very much enjoyed. Uh, Robert, of course, wants us to note, however, that Bruce, although famous for his fantastic acting, has also recorded multiple albums, uh, including... His first one, what was his his name? Bruno? Bruno, yeah, Bruno. what was it? Um, uh, he was referred to as Bruno right? yeah. during the Respect Yourself video. Yeah, we got yes. The Return Bruno. of Bruno. Yes, Bruno. so is Bruno. Oh, uh, R-A-D-O-L-I-N-I. -I. Radolini? Yeah. Sure, Radatui. Sure. So it's Bruno Radolini. Yes. So this was coming right out of his uh, Die Hard days. He, he of course, sang on his Unmoonlighting. Um, so he's showed his singing chops and clearly liked, you know, sort of uh, 50s and 60s songs, uh, R&B perhaps to some of this and uh, things like that. And, of course, his fantastic work for the wine coolers that he got to sing along and dance along to which was my favorite part of all of it, all of his wine cooler commercials. <clears throat> yeah, the, <But>. uh, <laughs> the YouTube had a link that I did not follow that said it was called Bruce Willis Blues Band. 
which caught my eye, but we were just getting ready to start the show before I had a chance to click on it. He so, does. He plays some harp. Uh, he plays that, some harp, man. He's yeah, not very I, good, I saw but... that. It was, it was a picture of him playing harmonica, and yeah. uh, looked like it might be interesting. You know, this is a chain of, uh, or I shouldn't say a chain, but a, a pattern of 80s actors singing, right? Think um, David Hasselhoff. Okay. Is that it? <laughs> Uh, is that yes, chain? We've think. got two links in the chain. Okay, there's probably others, but I can't think of them right now because <laughs> I was fairly young in the 80s. Okay. Right. Um, sure. Well, you do have Eddie Murphy had a top, I, maybe a number one song with That's that. That's true. Yeah. Eddie yeah. Murphy did some dumbass thing back when he was doing Gumby, right? Sometimes that party all the time. Oh, jeez. Was that Eddie Murphy? Yes. It's Eddie Murphy. Oh, I didn't know that. And yeah, I always get him confused, like, mentally with Eddie Murray, the Orioles baseball player. Because, <laughs> like, their names are close together. And so I always have to think twice, you know, which one are we talking about? Is Eddie Murphy the baseball player or the comedian? And so, hey, that's what happened, you know. You grow up in the 80s in Baltimore. You're going to hear about Eddie Murray a lot. Yeah, I guess so. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, of course, we began this this journey to honor Bruce, the second Bruce, uh, Bruce the second, as it were. Um, to talk about his Moonlighting. Moonlighting ran five seasons, but only 66 episodes, of which there actually weren't even 66 episodes of content with Bruce. There was a, a recap episode. There was a flashback episode. There was an episode that was just with um, Booger and the other secretary. Um, yep. Oh, God, so, that guy know, was on this... that show, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he oh, was. <laughs> um so, you know, not every one of those episodes were actually uh, involving Bruce. Uh, do you guys go back and watch any of this? Uh, I, I watched part of one episode. Part of one episode. Yeah. Chris? I watched a whole episode in part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a, I was, uh, I was working on some code this morning, and so I ran, uh, streamed. Uh, I think it was episode two of season one in the background and listened to it while I was working on a code. So, yeah, uh, he was actually singing in that episode, too, a little bit, not much. Okay. There wasn't, this wasn't the Shakespeare episode, was it? No, this is oh, the God. one where they get hired. It's pretty much, um, I don't, I think it is like the first time Civil Shepherd actually starts really working for the agency. Okay, right. so it's the first and episode so after first the pilot. Season. Okay. Yeah, he yeah. goes out, gets a uh, client sort of that they didn't really have, but he told her that they had, it convinces the client to come and um, use their agency. And then it turns out this guy is a hitman, and he claims he's looking for his son, but in fact it's another hitman that he wants to educate in the ways of being a hitman. In other words, basically what he wants to do is say, stop being a hitman. You'll regret it uh, when you die. Cause the older <laughs> hitman is like, is dying some slow death from some undescribed illness that he just keeps hacking up along every once in a while. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. That was a pretty straightforward explanation of what that episode was all about. I think it was called the shootout at the so, so corral. All right. And there is a if shootout. I, if it had been, if it had been an hour ago, I would have had the entire box series of uh, Moonlighting episodes. Um, my mother-in-law had those, so I was borrowing them. So I watched the pilot. I watched the episode that won uh, a bunch of awards. It was actually considered to be one of the 100 best episodes of, of TV by uh, AFI or something like that, which was the episode introduced by Orson Welles days before he died. They wow. actually got him to do an intro. They did two-thirds or... Actually, more than that. They did about 80% of the episode in black and white. Um, and that was, was really disconcerting to the network. They thought that basically that nobody would actually want to watch this or think something was wrong with their TV because it was going to be suddenly in black and white. So they got Orson Welles to come on and do an introduction to actually explain why this existed. Well done, Robert. So this is a good video. Good, <laughs> this is good excellent. Work. I tried to change my lighting. Is that any better? Get up! No, it's much worse. Uh, it's it's um, orange. Okay. Everything is orange. <laughs> it's orange. <laughs> this podcast just really goes up once ever Robert, Robert walks out of the room. Um, this is the height of professionalism, right here. Man. Every wow. light, just. Yeah. Where's my spotlight, Mister Mill? All is right. that better? Sure. Yes. So, it, so it you don't find out. Yeah. Just, yeah. Mike again. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. We're having a long conversation here, and you've walked out of it twice. 
There we go. Yeah. How about that? I actually yes. vaguely remember <laughs> this episode that you're talking about, the black and white episode yeah. of Moonlighting. I was yeah. pretty young though. I mean, I was I was nine when Moonlighting came out, but I do remember watching it um, throughout. I think pretty much all five seasons. I'm sure my, if my parents watched it, and if my parents watched it, I by default watched it because we had one TV. Well, there you go. Kids today, there's a thing called TV, and we only had one of them. That's right. Um, Did you guys break? No, bring up breaking the fourth wall when I was gone. No, but that's where I was about to go. So okay. go for it. Yeah, in the show, they break the fourth wall. <laughs> that, that's all you're gonna say? <laughs> no. Uh, it, it was. It was one of the revolutionary things they did at the time. They'd frequently, uh, the two characters um, never broke the fourth wall, but they'd have people come in and start moving things on set. Um, stuff would break. And I think in the very last episode, they have uh, workers come in and break down the set while they're on it. <laughs> uh, it was it was bizarre. So what do you mean by break the fourth wall? Are you talking about literally breaking one of the walls on the set? No, no, no. As in they they let you know that it's a TV show and it's like, everyone's quite aware. So it's, it's the a idea TV in, show. in a show, you'd see three walls, right? And the fourth yeah. wall right. is actually your screen. So they're actually right. going through the screen to let you know it's part of a show. You know, we know it's a show, et cetera. Yeah. I'd never heard that term before. Oh, uh, the, the movie I like the most that does it, I think the best is uh, Ferris Bueller's day off. Right. Yes. Okay. Where he just yeah. suddenly starts addressing the audience and then goes back to acting like they're not there. It's like a narration kind of an idea, but not really, because it actually is addressing the audience specifically. Yeah, but Moonlighting did it frequently. Yeah. Uh, but not yeah. the characters. The characters always stayed in character. It was everyone else right. that would just come in and move things. You know, if there was well, any they, errors, they would make like references you see the, the camera or the too. mic, they'd leave it in. <laughs> so it was yeah. bizarre. I would say that they, they would make references in the script to issues so they will actually call out points without being explicit they weren't talking to the camera but they would make comments about the show or things like that yeah which like still wow this dialogue strong. is kind of stiff and then keep on going yeah huh. so, um i also uh -huh. thought that it was one of the first shows to do the quick uh overlapping witty banter yeah um, that was it aaron sorkin that does that like crazy oh yeah sorkin yeah. was very much that way yeah, so, uh, but you're you're right. Like One that. of the things that's really interesting is they say that um, you know the the scripts were much longer than the normal script, and yet they still burned through them so quickly that part of the reason why they had to break the fourth wall, or they often had intros or things like that, was because they just ran out of script, and so they had time. They had to fill extra time, you know. So they uh, filled time by having them, you know, plea at the beginning of the episode about something, or they drop in, you know. Uh, uh, Orson Welles, or whatever it might be. Oh, I also read that uh, they frequently will show Sybil Shepherd's feet in episodes, just shots of her feet that were meant to be as filler till they could, because they were rewriting the script on the fly and they meant to replace it, and they just ended up just showing large shots of her feet and her walking places just to pad the show. <laughs> Which I think enough. is very Fair funny. Yeah. yeah, it sounds but, like we yeah. could actually learn from him letting um in terms of padding our show and especially the last episode <laughs> I, do we need to show feet i don't you don't need to see my feet man no mm -hmm. good point <laughs> just a little breakthrough everybody pause and now we have to do a commercial break that's right uh, brought oh, to you should... by the microphone whatever this thing is called i have no idea what kind of microphone cough guard you whatever this thing is cough oh guard. the pop pop filter pop filter yes brought to you by your local pop filter yeah so uh Okay. But this is a fantastic show. I mean, from from what it is, it's interesting because you watch it and you could see. No, you know, he was it's witty. not a fantastic show. The first two seasons were a fantastic show. Okay, whatever. There was fantastic <laughs> aspect, aspects of the show. It got horrible, man. There were fantastic aspects to the show. There was great banter. He definitely came off as a comedic actor. Because uh, I think one of the things that I got a real kick out of, they were talking about how in the um, the pilot, when they had the first fight scene, he couldn't stop himself from actually making fight sounds. Whenever he was like throwing punches, he'd be like, pow, bam, et cetera, which I thought <laughs> is awesome. Because um, just people having fun, yeah. right? And I think yeah, that's, that's the point. Yeah. So I think the show came off that way. Sybil Shepard was a big star, though she wasn't, you know, she'd had some flops and Bruce Willis was mostly an unknown. So it really was an interesting approach that way. Well, she was kind of a has-been at this point. It brought oh, yeah, her yeah. back. Yeah. Well, I also think that uh, 
Another thing they noted in the trivia, which I didn't know until I read the trivia, was Die Hard was season four of Moonlighting. And season four is when it goes totally to hell. Because Simple Shepherd is all pissed off that he's now a famous movie star. And he didn't like being second billing given he was now a famous movie star. Uh, that she wouldn't be on set and recorded everything months ahead of time. And they had to just fit in her dialogue around there. And it's, everything just went all to hell. Um, but that the urban legend for this, which I totally bought, was that what killed Moonlighting was when they got together. You know, that there wasn't the whole sexual tension thing. Uh, but apparently that's just all, you know, internet no, I mean, there was real life gets in the way. He started to grow a, a movie career. She had yeah. kids and didn't want to do the set, you know, do the, spend that amount of time on set. Yeah, but you hear everybody say it, calling it the Moonlighting effect. We can't let these two characters get together. It will be destroyed like Moonlighting. Yes, because yeah. that was the only problem. Well, that I thought that was the only problem for you. I didn't know any of this stuff, you know, because they kept talking about in the when the X Files was on that you could never let Mulder and Scully get together because that would destroy the show because that destroyed Moonlighting. So I, I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Clearly, yeah. you think I'm full of crap. That's Stevens. Robert's full of crap. Look, that one there. <laughs> Why am I pointing over here? Which no one can see what I'm pointing. At. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, that screen right here. Do you see the screen? <laughs> yeah, the see, one over me, here, which sense, is them. I can see here. Yep. If I point up here, that's Robert. If I point here, it's right. Chris. <laughs> oh, see, if I point like this. Oh, wait, let me get yeah, the no. camera. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Robert. Does it work so well? Because <laughs> yeah. since I control the, the video that you're, that our audience is watching, oh, they uh, will see that this is Robert and this is Chris <laughs> and this is Steve. Okay. Oh, yes. And by the way, for those who are listening on podcasts, this is actually really effing fantastic <laughs> video yeah, watch yeah. so you really should be watching the video yeah. those of you that are listening to the audio only good choice <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wouldn't want to look at us either so, and, oh. and one of these days i'll figure out my lighting issues so i don't look i look like a pasty freaking ghost no, well robert, actually robert I'm sorry um, to tell you man i am yeah. a pasty ghost yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, why don't we talk about the movies we aren't covering? Because uh, Stephen added this in. I think it was him. Yes. So yeah. we just just to give us a a setup here. Obviously, our our listeners are huge Bruce Willis fans, and Bruce, of course, you know your own filmography. Um, but we're going to try to sort of set up what we're not going to cover by talking about a couple of the famous films that he's done. That um, excuse me, we're going to set up what we are going to cover by saying films that we're not. Um, Last Boy Scout, uh, I actually regret not covering here. That was fantastic film. Damon Wayans, Wayans at his best. Uh, oh God, that was just that was just a great film. And yeah, I like um, that one. No, Damon Wayans at his best was Homie the Clown. <laughs> God, that was a horrible <laughs> film. In yeah. Living Color, go for it. <laughs> yeah, those guys were awesome. I miss that show. Yeah, that's a good show. Um, we have the M Night Shyamalan time period films we have the sixth sense we yeah, have unbreakable and then once bruce willis started stopped being in his movies they were completely unwatchable so you can say either he ran out of ideas or he lost bruce willis pick which one of these you want so i'm gonna say mostly he lost bruce willis yeah i still um, wish they do a uh, sequel to unbreakable well that now in today's world it would actually make sense given the superhero stuff it it, it would make bank yeah yeah I'll call it breakable breakable <laughs> <laughs> Un still unbreakable yeah. not a very quite, short broken. movie about a very delicate man <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just call it oops very nice um sin city which of course they're currently are making a sequel to but uh we'll miss out bruce from that yep. uh looper which is a modern day decent sci-fi time traveler film uh which was pretty good except for the fact that i did not like the um Special effects when they did on Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the whole thing to try to make him look more Bruce oh, Willis. Really bad prosthetics and yeah, yeah it was yeah. just After awful. the fact CGI. Yeah. But, but it was cool that that movie did sort of like the opposite of the typical time traveler question. You know, go back in time and kill your grandfather, as opposed to this. You know, right. yeah. you know, go back in time and have be killed by a younger self. So yeah, interesting uh, story. I liked that movie quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, there was good parts of the ending seemed to be unrealistic to me because they could have done it in a much easier way, but we'll ignore that point for those who haven't watched it. And then, of course, we have his uh, intervening films between his biggest films. And, uh, time period, he, of course, had Look Who's Talking, which was the down Travolta years. 
uh, and look who's talking to, and look who's talking again, and are there other people talking or something like Looks that? Looks sad now. Damn much I think money that, that movie was the made. Dogs. Oh yeah, no, I I don't fault Bruce at all for his fantastic work on that. Um, good money to be had, and probably a lot less work in reality than than Travolta or whatnot. Um, so that's perfectly fine for me. So. Those are the films that we are not covering. Uh, we're instead going to switch to Robert and his randomness of film choices. I don't think it's that random. I'm looking up how much no. money Look Who's Talking made. I remember it oh, making a have that ridiculous you amount. On. Yeah, it made $140 million. It's good money. Which yeah. is, I think, double to triple what any of the ones I picked made. Which just tells you that the American movie viewing audience is broken. Uh, if they want to watch stupid talking babies so okay let's move into yeah me rambling I should tell you so that you don't waste your time you can't make me angry please spend an hour with him okay so for my segment oh each of us picked three movies by the way we never did say that did we I don't think no, so no I don't think we what? did no, no. Um, it's a secret so I picked three. I don't want it a, a little bit of variety. So I picked a sort of an action-y drama, a comedy, and then, well, kind of an action comedy. Um, basically, I picked one where he's the bad guy. Uh, he's, he's comedic. And then he plays a straight man in a comedy. So my first one was The Jackal, the 1997 film, which is, I mean, Bruce Willis played The Jackal, but it's really more Richard Gere- uh, Sidney Poitier movie. Uh, they had the best lines. Uh, I, I love this film. I, I don't know why I love this film. It's not, it doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with the books uh, that it ripped off the title of. Uh, but uh, I thought Bruce Willis was really good. Um, I do have a sound clip. Ooh, sound clip time. So this is the clip of him accepting uh, the gig. It's pretty much the only bit where he really says anything other than all the snarky crap at the end where he totally breaks out of character and looks like a twisted version of his character from Moonlighting. Uh, but so here's the clip. If I take this job, I'll have to disappear forever. So if you want me to do this, you're going to have to pay me. How much? American dollars. All cash, of course. Half now, half upon completion. Seventy million. <laughs> Why not? Done. So that's about as animated and uh, over the top as he gets in this film. It's it's not really a Bruce Willis vehicle, but I liked him as the bad guy. I thought he played a good bad guy. Uh, it was an interesting character. Uh, it allowed all the other characters in the film to have someone to play against, really. Uh, it's really more, it's a Richard Gere vehicle. But uh, I liked the Jackal. I thought he did a, a really good job. I would like to see him in another film, and I can't think of one, maybe you guys can, where he plays the bad character, the anything. Hmm. I mean, other than that, that bit from Pulp Fiction, but that doesn't count. No, nah, he wasn't the bad guy in Pulp Fiction. Uh, think of anything? I can't. I, you know, in, in the Expendables two, I wouldn't call him a bad guy, but he's definitely not buddies with the star, like the heroes. Oh, Church. Yeah, well, Church yeah. is an ass. Yeah. Yeah. And then in my next film, uh, the whole nine yards. I mean, he's a he's a hitman uh, for the mob in re Witness Relocation. But there, I, I don't, also don't really see him as the bad guy. Um, it's It was uh, in 2000. It's a pretty straight-up comedy. It's really, this one also is not really a Bruce Willis vehicle. It's it's more Matthew Perry yeah. is the main character. Um, yeah, Bruce Willis is uh, in witness relocation from Chicago to someplace in Canada. I can't remember where. And it's, it's one of those farces where nobody's who you think they are everybody's taking out hits against everybody else uh it's called michael clark duncan in it uh in a role that i thought uh he was pretty good 
Mm. It's really sad. I was really sad when he was no longer making films. Um, Because everything, I liked everything he was in. He had some Hmm. really great charisma, especially for such a giant man. Yeah. Um, Had a little bit of Kevin Pollack. No, you don't like everything that he was in. Yeah. That's not a correct statement. You may have liked all the the jobs he's done, but you can't say, oh, you know, Daredevil? Great film. Oh, yeah. I loved him in it, though. That's what I'm saying. You can can say that, and I'm fine with that statement. (laughs) Yeah. His bits in films, I loved all those bits. So, yeah, but you're right. Daredevil was... Ooh yeah, that film was crap. Batman, starring Batman. Yeah, Batman. Yeah, the new Batman. That's all we need. Um, so he was good. Kevin Pollock was in the film. Uh, I particularly like him. Uh, nuts. He's a fantastic actor, uh, but mainly because he does the best William Shatner impression of anyone I know. Kevin Pollock uh, uh, does great William Shatner. So if you've never seen it, you you need to do yourself a favor and see him do William Shatner so uh the whole nine yards it was fun it unfortunately had a sequel called the whole 10 yards uh, yep. which was uh-huh. horrid uh the first one's good you know just well, nice was, light comedy what was clear from this you know this is not a bruce focused statement but um matthew perry was the most successful friends actor i guess in terms of actually making films that were watchable um Schwimmer yeah, made true. some not that watchable films and so on and so forth, but um, you know, hold nine yards and the uh, that one where he knocked up a girl in Vegas, Salma Hayek in Vegas. Um, I don't there's know a couple that other one. ones. Yeah, well, yeah. there's a couple of films that were watchable, but this was another one. It was you know Matthew uh, Perry being you know the same character from Friends, Bruce Willis being a hitman version of himself, yeah. you know, from a bunch of his other films. Yeah. Um, it felt like an easy film to make, but it was something that was easy to watch for 90 minutes. I mean, it was definitely oh, yeah. not something that you were like, Oh my God, I got to strain through it. Like it's wanted dead or alive or something like that. Hey, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, it was, it's imminently watchable comedy. Uh, yeah. Not one that was really worth repeat viewing. Um, yeah, you don't you don't need to come back to it one over and, and done. over again. But but, yeah. but I don't regret having watched it. I yes. do regret yes. having watched the sequel. That was two hours of my life I'll never get back. Still I don't think better I saw than it. that terrible terrible film that Chris made us watch. So uh, Maximum uh, Overdrive. Which one? <laughs> yeah, Maximum Overdrive. Oh, that was an awesome movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to think. You say terrible movie, and Maximum Overdrive is not coming to my mind. Oh, uh, okay. And then uh, my final film was Red, the 2010 film, uh, retired and uh, extremely dangerous, based on the Warren Ellis comic. Yeah. Um, this I really like. You never would know if some, unless someone tells you. You don't know this is based on a comic book, no. right? It, it doesn't have that feel at all. But I, right. I think that's the nature of uh, Warren Ellis comics, anyway. Most of those, if you translated them into film, no one would have any idea they were comic books. Uh, but this I really liked. Uh, Bruce Willis is clearly the main actor. But also, mm-hmm. again, it's to me, this isn't an iconic Bruce Willis film. To this, to me, this was a this really cool ensemble film. Where yeah. You get Morgan Freeman and John Malkovich mm-hmm. and Helen Miriam with, I think, th- the best character in the film. Uh, I think she was fantastic. And, and John yeah, Malkovich great, yeah. playing and- crazy but not too crazy, kind of comic crazy. I really liked. Yeah. You know, normally well, he does that well. so I mean, damn his, intense usually. Well, his, his stuff in like rounders was, was a similar without as much comedy version of it, yeah. but it felt that same kind of like strong, interesting, not normal, you know, kind of character, you know, definitely not a, a straightforward kind of character. Yeah. Um, so this one though, uh, red has red too, which I've only seen the first little bit of, uh, I was trying to get through it today, but it's definitely not appropriate for a two-year-old in the room. Uh, yeah, we, I, my wife and I watched it. Uh, we watched it like over Memorial Day weekend, and she fell asleep during it, which is bad for an action comedy. Oh, um, this does not bode well. It, well, um, it was not. It, it could feel that it was slapped together. It wasn't put together that nearly as well as Red was. Red seemed like it had a purpose. There was a they were, they were trying to accomplish something and so forth. Red 2 right. seemed to be, hey, let's get all those people back together again somehow. Yeah, money grab. Um, yeah. Which is too bad because I, I, this, well, with the exception of, of, of Die Hard, 
and maybe Unbreakable. Uh, this was definitely my favorite Bruce Willis film. I don't know why it just appealed to me. I like uh, ensemble casts, especially when they're really seasoned actors. Yeah, you know, because yeah. they just gel and in, you enjoy the personalities. It's right. just fun to watch them on screen. Well, uh, that's one of the big differences with with Red Two. There's no Morgan Freeman, and Helen Mirren is really briefly in the film. Oh, the, what's the so? Point? If you're missing two of the best actors yeah. from the previous film, that's going to hurt, right? Yeah. You know? But I still thought her performance was one of the better ones in the film, even oh, though yeah. she was in there briefly. I, the film yeah. Red 2 is fine. It's it's one of those movies that you'll watch and you won't regret. Okay. I don't know. That's how I felt about it. Uh, and then Red also had, uh, you know, it had Richard Dreyfus, It had Ernest mm -hmm. Borgnine. I mean, mm -hmm. this film had, I mean, these are old Hollywood stars I and mean, they've been around forever mm -hmm. um, also has randy wade kelly jason guoliano alec ramey yeah oh, uh, Carl emily Urban. Carota. was he the main uh the, the young <laughs> protagonist <laughs> but i didn't hear you naming random people well done <laughs> i just started naming random people off imdb oh you bastard yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna screw with you in your segment <laughs> yeah. Yeah. see the problem is you can't say that robert this well, yeah. is the, the issue with comedy. You don't start off by saying, I'm going to do right now is going to say something that's not going to be true. And you're going to find it funny because it's not true. Not the best work. Yeah, but you know me. By the time we get around to his segment, I'll forget I was even supposed to do it. That's what I was going to say. He'll forget it anyway. So <laughs> That's why it's funny. Coffee. Now. Let's have some coffee. Yeah, I should go make some coffee. I can wander off camera again. <laughs> yeah, you should do that. <laughs> I need to have like an intermission <laughs> sign that I just put up here. Yeah. Intermission time. Ah, and I gotta hit, quit hitting my damn mic. What the hell? So, yeah, you're Very welcome. As you can see, I, I'm, I'm a broadcast professional. <laughs> yeah, yes. I have no cough button either. Um, wow, and I don't think I have any other sounds from any of the stuff I did. Mainly because there aren't, none of these have like cool Bruce Willis quotes. Yeah, these are not right. quotable films. Um, well, they are, but none of the good quotes are from Bruce Willis. Um, so, so those are my three uh, of the ones there. I would definitely recommend if you haven't seen The Jackal, see that. That's a great film, uh, and Red, and and if you want a light comedy that you won't regret watching, but you won't go, oh my god, I got to watch that over and over and over. I mean, it's not like Groundhog Day, um, right. Stripes or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which, wow, we're. I can't Did we remember lose his you name. Here? What's his name? Yeah, I, I just Murray. thought Bill Murray. Up. <laughs> I, can't remember. I definitely you, need some coffee. Mid-sentence, you just just stop and freeze. This is good. this is yeah. awesome. This is awesome video and audio. Yeah, everybody will just think it was completely fine. freezing. Camera, right? <laughs> it was this Skype. I believe Skype. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dead God. air, we frozen suck. video. Damn, we're good. It'll get better. <laughs> we promise it will get better. It can't get worse. <laughs> it will get well, better. Last week was worse. Uh, so we've, I think we've, last week was yeah. That was pretty damn bad. So, um, although I think if we go back and if I do some judicious editing, uh, your guys' segments weren't bad. It was mine that was horrible. It was like so we're it was doing anything on drinking. Episode over drink. That's what I was going to say. We have a good solid five minutes of radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was bad. It's a bumper. Normally, we need to cut that one. Was all pad. We well, just just add stuff from previous episodes again. See in case you know they didn't. You know we'll have a clip show. <laughs> it's already right? time for Greatest a clip hits. show. <laughs> Uh, best that of. was actually one of my favorite things. Do you guys ever watch um, Clerks, the animated series? No. No. Clerks actually, is your thing, not. man. Yeah. So there was a segment. They, they did the first episode, and then I think it was the second episode, they did a recap show. Nice. Are you serious? Which is, that, it was hilarious. <laughs> it was actually so good from doing it that perspective, because you oh, don't damn. do that. No. Right. But it's like, we got filler material already. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let's move on to Steven's segment. Self-realization, I was thinking of the immortal words of Socrates who said, I drank what? All right, so I guess I'm up to the, uh, the plate, as it were, right now. And I get the, I would call some of the best films, the biggest films that uh, Bruce has done in his career. Um, the three that I want to cover are Die Hard, Pulp Fiction, and uh, 12 Monkeys. 
Um, I could add in a couple more that I would have said, you know, again, were, were iconic films as well. But when I was able to get away with those, since I think, Chris, you claimed yours first and I was able to grab these afterwards and feel very good about what I was able to, to, to watch uh, and, and, and talk about. Um, so for those of you who have been living under a rock or, let's say, are under the age of three, um, the biggest film – the most iconic role for Bruce Willis, of course, is Die Hard. Die Hard, which is 1988, uh, was um, sort of an interesting background to the film. Um, it was originally written to be a sequel to the movie Commando from Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is an 85 film. Um, but in that situation, Schwarzenegger didn't want to come back, so they had to come up with something else. And they tried to edit this. Actually, if you go further back, they were adapting a book which got turned into an, a sequel to Commando, which got moved on. Um, and for as crazy as it was, as you can think about this right now, Bruce was not considered to be a star. And so this film actually went out to Sylvester Stallone, Harrison Ford, Don Johnson, Richard Gere, Clint Eastwood, and Burt Reynolds, among others, Burt Reynolds. who all turned this down before Bruce Can you Bruce imagine accepted. Burt Reynolds? <laughs> oh, that'd be actually interesting. It would be a terrible film, but it would be really interesting. With his um, laugh, his laugh is even weirder than. Oh, that's what that's a clip. I oh, I wish I had his laugh. Bruce Willis has this laugh that is pretty damn good. But yeah, oh, um, sorry, man. No, no, no worries, no worries. So, it, what's even more interesting is that he had to turn it down when, when it finally came around to Bruce to be offered this. He had to turn it down because he was doing moonlighting, and then suddenly Sybil she Shepherd got pregnant, and he's like, okay, well, we've got spare capacity i can go do this now so he finally was able to go and say yes um which of course was the best move that that he could make for his career because this again changed everything for for bruce um in in every possible way you know he really did launch his career uh from this it's is notable for a lot of things one is it created a whole genre um which is the die hard in a kind of movie so die hard on a bus is speed right, right. um die hard on a boat is speed too um I know that for many years, <laughs> sorry, for many years, Kevin Smith wanted to have Die Hard in a mall, uh, et cetera. So there's been a lot of attempts to try to sort of capture this. And the reason was, is that it was one man in a s situation really being heroic and being, you know, bigger than life, but not sort of like a superhero, which I think is the part that was lost to some extent in the future films. In this film, he didn't do anything superhero-esque. Um, other than perhaps the issue when he wrapped the fire hose around himself and jumped off the side of the building. We can call that one sort of, okay, that's tenuous at best if that would work. Um, but everything else seemed, you know, just a really bad day for a guy trying to, you know, ha meet up with his wife. Which for those who, who watch uh, Parenthood, his wife is actually the grandmother from Parenthood. Which every single time that I've watched Parenthood or every single time that I've watched Die Hard since that Parenthood came out, I'm like, that, that can't be the same woman. Um, but it is, and uh, good for her. Um, notable <laughs> facts her. about this film. It's actually Alan Rickman's first movie. He had been an actor for many years. He uh, uh, was stage actor and so forth. And at 44 or something like that, they brought him in for this film. Now, Alan Rickman is well known as, in himself. done a bunch of, of memorable roles, and he was fantastic in this. Uh, and it was just really a lucky thing that they were able to get Alan Rickman for this this part and really do something special. I mean, he was a fantastic villain. Uh, secondly, although the film is posited to be sort of in, in front of being about terrorists that are trying to take hostages and so forth, it turns out that that's just a red herring and they're all about the money. And apparently the, the writer, director, um, I think the director, McTiernan, said, you know what, I don't like terrorist films i think they're depressing that you know that there's not something good about that but but this is basically a bank robbery film and that could be funny and i wanted it to be funny um which i really thought was a it was a, a great twist on it is he still um, in jail what mcdurden is he still in jail i don't think so i don't know how much time he had to serve for that hmm. i don't think he might have just paid fine i don't know if he actually served time um what other weird things? Alan Rickman, during out the, the film, anytime they shot a gun, he was actually scared and he flinched every time it happened. So they had to do a cutaway shot. If you watch the film every time, you'll never see him and the gun at the same time. Uh, stage actors not don't have a lot of, uh, you know, blasty, blowy-uppy thingies. Right. Um, 
lot of other things that are kind of ridiculous about this film. Well, it is a Christmas movie. It is a Christmas movie. It's, it's, it's best, actually it's the Christmas best Christmas movie, movie, ever. movie ever written. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, in fact, a Christmas story, I would debate with that. That nope. is the best Christmas film nope. of all time. But nope. Die Hard is a fantastic die hard, Christmas movie. It's Die Hard. No, no Christmas story. No, you'll put your eye out with that. No, no, in fact, no. I think TNT should show Die Hard back to back, nonstop <laughs> on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Yeah. Well, you can do Die Hard and Die Hard Two, since Die Hard Two is the same movie but set in the Washington Dulles uh, Airport. I you actually do, like, like the second one. The, Die hard movies. the second one I, I genuinely enjoyed, uh, yeah. and even though I'm a huge Samuel L. Jackson fan, the third one was damn near unwatchable for me. Which is funny. A lot of people really love that film, and I don't oh, get it. God, it's awful. I, I did not enjoy that. But that's also where it transitioned to or the fourth or less fifth realistic. Or 23rd one. Yeah. I, uh... yeah. Then I there didn't was even see the last and... one. The one with the kid in Russia thing. Yeah. Yeah, that was the fifth one. Yeah. Uh, I didn't watch that. A good day to it die wasn't... hard. Or... Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not not nearly as fun. I think that's the problem is that it becomes superhero esque. You know, the guy's not dying. It didn't become well, snarky. Just... anymore. Yeah. So, Die Hard needs to be an R-rated film. It doesn't work as PG. No. Yeah. So, but which is... uh, the first one and the second one, which again was the exact same film, only this time in Washington Dulles, though filmed in the in California, because you can see the Pacific Bell tel- uh, telephone uh, payphones throughout the whole place. Oh, really? Which oh, yeah. is really awkward. I didn't notice that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, you know, as a guy who spent a lot of time at the Washington Dulles Airport, I'm like, I don't recognize that. I don't recognize that. What's going on here? But, you know, you know what are you going to do? Mm. Um, so fantastic film. I know that all of our, our listeners have, have actually watched this. So uh, I don't know that why I'm giving that much of a, of a background. But I think that's why I didn't give so much about the plot points. But I liked the little pieces, pieces that maybe not everybody had known about Die Hard. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite was a- non-Die Hard, Die Hard movie? I mean, speed's quite ridiculous and over the top. You know, we've yeah. had a lot of Keanu conversations, which I think, by the way, our our next media segment is going to be Keanu oriented. Uh, it's a good chance about having an honoring of Keanu. Yeah, that's a good choice. So, what about you, Chris? What's your favorite Die Hard ripoff? Uh, gosh, I don't know. Speed, sure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm copping out. One. <laughs> I'm copping Don't out. make cop out. Cop out is a terrible, as by far the worst <laughs> Bruce Willis film. Oh God, that was a Bruce Willis film. Yeah, that is the only film that my wife has made me turn off wow. while we watched together. That's bad, man. It, I mean, it's not, it was like she wanted to walk out of the room. She didn't want to just walk out of the room. She did not want me to watch the film anymore. <laughs> you know? uh, but I think my yeah. favorite one is Under Siege. That's Die Hard mm-hmm. on a boat. Oh, uh, Die Hard yeah. on a boat with the skinny uh, Steven Skull. Yeah, yeah. Not the Wow, I love donuts, Steven Skull. <laughs> so it's the only other i think watchable steven seagal movie that very first one he did hard to kill no 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 before that oh there were all three word titles yeah. above the law that one yeah, yeah. okay yeah i'd like that hard one because that was his very first which is the one, one that he was in a coma for a long time hard to kill was that hard to kill, hard to kill. that was hard yeah. to kill yeah, yeah. that one's fantastic he rolled out of bed after being in a coma for like a decade and he could just go and like throw roundhouses it's yeah. awesome yeah but uh yeah i liked above the law and i, I liked under siege uh, that was pretty good but that's has um oh god he was in the fugitive with harrison ford this will happen a lot. I can't remember. Gene Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, that's Tommy Lee is. Jones was in Under Siege, and he was fantastic. So, yes, you you do need to have like a, a clip. It's basically, you know, a sign you hold up that says, no, I'm not uh, I'm not buffering. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not <laughs> paused. Yeah. My brain is buffering. Yeah, my brain is buffering. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a um, constant So that, state, that's though. my diehard thing. Uh, you guys have any more diehard we want to move on? Any else you want to cut into that? Oh, uh, we should probably move on. We, we're only giving these people an hour, right? Yeah. yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, the second one is Pulp Fiction. We can do this one a little bit faster, I guess. Pulp Fiction, uh, as everybody, again, oh, wait, wait, probably wait, wait, know, wait. is a uh, 94 on, film, hold on, hold on. the Quit first talking. big film from Quentin. What? Good talking for a sec. Yippee Koy. There you go. <laughs> you can't even give us the whole quote because we're trying hey, to keep this a clean tag. Yeah, yeah it's not even worth playing. That was my Die Hard yeah. one. I had to play the Die Hard one. <laughs> Sorry, oh, go man. ahead. But anyway, moving on from your diehard <laughs> misquote. Uh, Pulp Fiction, 94, Quentin Tarantino. That's what I say. 
<laughs> I run the soundboard. <laughs> anyway, uh, this one fits sort of the Robert segment that he is that Bruce is not the star, though he does star in a segment of this film. Um, as everybody who's watched Pulp Fiction knows, it's basically a series of segments. Uh, and he picks up one in the middle where uh, it follows the really uncomfortable conversation about keeping the watch up the uh, uh, the butt of what's his name, um, which then passes back down and thus becomes the motivation or the MacGuffin, as it were, for the entire uh, Bruce Willis section where he has to go back and get this, which then gets run into uh, bring out the gimp and, and all those other fantastic parts. Um What's interesting is this sort of comes between sort of the diehard big years and then the next stuff that that came out. Um, So he had done and made a lot of money off of Look Who's Talking and Look Who's Talking 27. He had made money off of Die Hard 2 and he had a couple other little things in there. But we also have some bad films that came in that time period, which Chris will cover at least in part. I think Chris Um, got the the best ones, man. (laughs) So what, what's interesting is that he was he actually had to take a pay cut for this this film and actually that's comes becomes a theme of, of Bruce's career is that he took a pay cut in a lot of films because he wanted to do the part. Um, and I thought that's that's interesting to me. Um, but it was was the other part that he was able to, to be in a film at the same time as John Travolta though not team up with John Travolta it relaunched John Travolta's career and I think in some respects did the same for Bruce who was going strong but it helped you know be a part a central part a starring part of the film, the iconic film from 1994. If you're going to go back and say, what is the the film that most people will associate with 1994? It's Pulp Fiction. Uh, basically, anybody who was high school, college age at that time, they would connect to Pulp Fiction. Yep. Um, I, I so, like and then it. with this one, yeah. I don't like Pulp Fiction. Uh, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, I think you're Pulp Fiction, you just need to have the diner scene. Yeah, that should be the whole film. The diner scene at the beginning, the diner scene at the end, and cut out everything in between. No, 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 no. But uh, no, you definitely could have be, all these different parts. Well, I'm not a big Tarantino fan, so that could be part of it. I mean, I didn't Again, like Reservoir broken. Dogs, and I think that is generally accepted as one of his best films. And I, I don't, I just can't do his stuff. I don't know why. Yeah, but without Pulp Fiction, how would you know what a quarter pounder is called in France? <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, really, I that's be culturally what deprived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I like nah. this much like Clerks. I just don't get why people love this film. Yes, and we'll have to have a Kevin Smith segment just for you, or maybe I'll just have a you know Kevin Smith hour of power for you. No, no, no. Um, I don't have a Kevin Smith issue. I, although my favorite Kevin Smith film is his documentary of Prince. <laughs> it's a different point too. Yeah. Sorry, so moving right along from this, um, my third film that just to introduce briefly is 12 Monkeys. And I think the reason I in part want to introduce 12 Monkeys is that it's coming out on sci-fi as a TV show next year. Um, well, I'm not sure how. You want the I'm clip? not sure what they're going to do. Um, clip? You want the clip? Want the clip, clip, clip? Oh, far. Yes, please show me. Get your clips. This is a place for crazy people. I'm not crazy. We don't use that term crazy, Mr. Cole. We've got some real nuts here. There aren't so, a lot of good clips those, of him in this either. Well, again, this They're this this Brad has Pitt. pieces and parts. Um, it's it's a really interesting post-apocalyptic world time travel film, right? Mm. So you do have this. So you can get another theme. He picks up the time travel later on in Looper and so forth. Um, but this one, he... It, you could sort of sent back to when he was a kid in pre-apocalyptic Philadelphia, which I'm not sure how you tell the difference between post-apocalyptic and pre-apocalyptic <laughs> Philadelphia, nor that point. Um, and basically he has to go there and he gets stuck in, in Maryland. He gets stuck in a mental institution with Brad Pitt. Uh, and this was Brad Pitt just as it sort of breaks. So I think they filmed it before he broke as a big actor and it came out. And by this time he was already starting to get big. And this was probably this one of his before biggest after roles. Seven. What was this before or after seven? Do you know? Uh, I believe it was before seven. Pretty sure it's before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this is the thing that you know Brad Pitt was the pretty boy up to this point, and this was him doing some interesting things. Um, 
but you know, with this, Bruce was an interesting guy. You know, he was he was all sort of shook shook up. Uh, he was a criminal who was you know trying to get out of time served by going back in time. Um, kind of interesting approach to the character. Interesting movie all around. It was Terry Gilliam. If you like Terry Gilliam stuff, this definitely fits his view of the world in a Brazil sense or something like that. Has a little bit of comedy. Has a little bit of very off kilter view of the world. Um, it's a a remake of a French film, which also fits Gilliam's view of the world pretty well. Uh, and again, it's it's like I said on on Pulp Fiction, he had to take a pay cut to do this film as well. Bruce Willis did, um, because he wanted to make the film, and it was a great role. I think it was a a great acting job, and it was eminently watchable. It's a film that you could go back and watch over and over and over again. Uh, I don't know that I have a lot more to add beyond that, though. I will say it is probably top three or four films for me for Bruce Willis as well that I like to watch and something I can watch multiple times and I'm really curious to see how they translate that into a TV show. It would be missing Bruce, but it could be quite interesting. Yeah, I, I like 12 Monkeys. So not my favorite Terry Gilliam thing, but my favorite one no. most people hate and that's Time Bandits. Um, Who hates Time Bandits? Most people don't like that film, man. Uh I mean, if, if you like Terry Gilliam, you like Time Bandits. Yeah, but it's got some odd pacing. All all the weird bits of it are what appeal to me. Um, but in everybody's knee jerk, got to be offended by everything. Sort of nature, you know. Just but Connery is isn't he like Mesopotamian in there or something like that? He's never what he's supposed to be. Why can't we just yeah, the man is a Scot? <laughs> he's Scottish. Yeah. Con Connery is Scottish in every film, no matter what the actual film is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I think it's a fantastic film. Um, Brazil, Time Bandits, um, Fisher King even has its redeeming parts. Um, I don't love it top to bottom, but I think there's some great parts to it. But even The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen is, in small chunks, really interesting film. So Yeah, it just, uh, the problem was taking him and Robin Williams, which I think is why they ended up doing The Fisher King, to show that they actually could work together. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it just uh it's just a weird film. Yeah. So Yeah. All right. So Chris, that's what I've got anything, to say. Anything to dish on Steven's films? Uh not much. I have 12 Monkeys on my DVR. I don't I haven't watched the whole thing yet. Uh Pulp Fiction, love that movie. Die Hard, like I said, it's my favorite Christmas movie. Yeah. So yeah, I like 12 Monkeys. It's something I'd like to revisit maybe every 5 years. That's fair. Yeah. Um because it just needs a little time for me to, the bits I like about it, I have to forget the film. Uh, otherwise, it's just like, oh, I just saw that. Man. It's not that bit of fun surprise. Because um, otherwise, it's just Bruce drooling a lot. <laughs> so, let's, uh, okay. I have a random clip here. I don't know what it's for. I'm going to play it. Well, Lamont, that's speed tested now. Mm -hmm. Speed test. So. Oh, it's the bit from the jackal. Run. <laughs> Thank you for that random clip okay. that's not associated with anything we've just done. <laughs> I mean, run. Now. So, clearly I did not label these well. I thought that was the 12 Monkeys clip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's you played the 12 Monkeys clip, man. I thought yeah. I had two. All right. As promised, I have a new bumper. Yay me. Uh, my three <laughs> movies are three of my um, favorite uh, Bruce Willis movies. And I know some people don't like Hudson Hawk, but those people are wrong. Uh, Hudson Hawk <laughs> is an excellent movie about a recently released ex-con named Hudson Hawk. Uh, well, it's actually not his real name, but he talks about in the movie why he's called Hudson Hawk, which I won't spoil it for you. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to spoil <laughs> Hudson Hawk. He's caught up in a complicated um, prime ring involving some really weird billionaires, the CIA, and the Catholic Church. And he goes from the, you know, New Jersey to Italy and has all kinds of hijinks where 
he and his friend uh, Tommy Five Tone, played by Danny Aiello, sing songs while they rob places. And uh, that's pretty much the movie is uh, Bruce Willis and Danny Aiello singing songs while doing stuff. Also has Andy McDowell as Anna, who is a uh, nun who works for the Vatican and is trying to uh, basically protect these artifacts from Da Vinci. The artifacts would be used by the billionaires to basically turn lead into gold and they want to ruin the economy. And Andy McDowell's character is essentially there to try to stop them. She doesn't realize that Bruce Willis and Danny Aiello are trying to stop them too. So they work against each other for a while. They start working together and then, you know, Bruce Willis and uh, Andy McDowell end up becoming a couple, even though she's a nun, but that's okay. Cause you know, the nun said that God said it was okay. So we're all good in there. Um, so I like the movie. It's campy, it's fun, and it doesn't take itself seriously at all. And I think that's what makes it good. If it tried to take itself seriously, it'd be horrible. <laughs> but it doesn't. Yeah, I, have, um, I think there are parts, you know, I, despite my statement that I don't love this film, I think it's almost because I think it could have been a much better film. If it had been them okay. being, you know, crime caper-esque, you know, you focus on the two of them, crime capers. Get rid of the well, Catholic part Church. Brilliant. Get rid of Andy McDowell. Yeah. I, I just would have liked it more. You know, they could have had the witty banner. They could have had the ridiculousness. And I think it would have been more fun to me. Sure. No, well, fair enough. Uh, I could definitely see that. Um, I liked the fact that I, I yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought I liked it the way it was. I thought it was funny that the CIA agents named themselves after candy bars. Uh, before they were named after venereal diseases, you know, that, <laughs> I don't know. I just I think it's a fun movie. It's not a movie I watch every year, but it's definitely an every other year kind of movie for me. I even own okay. it on Blu-ray or something. Uh, <laughs> the other the other uh, one of the movies I, I watched uh, for this week was uh, Fifth Element from 1997, which I think is also a pretty good movie uh, about a cab driver played by Willis uh, named Corbin uh, Dallas and Corbin Dallas Corbin Dallas sorry I misspoke Corbin Dallas and he gets involved with a search for secret weapon to stop an evil creature from destroying all life on earth again it's campy uh, and that's okay it's what makes uh, the movie fun it's set in the future um, the fifth element is a supreme being played by Mila Jovovich and sort of Bruce Willis and uh, Mila Jovovich playing off each other is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, it's got Gary Oldman as the lead bad guy, yeah. Mr. Zorg. It has Tommy Tiny Lister as the president, who also had an excellent role as Zeus on the No Holds Bar with Hulk Hogan back in the 80s. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. The first time I saw that movie, I was like, hey, that's Zeus. Uh, and then, of course, there's in, Chris uh, Tucker Idiot as Chris. Ruby Rod. And Chris uh, Tucker has a really, I think, cool part in the movie, sort of this uh, loud, obnoxious TV host. Well, he's the uh, sidekick. Yeah, he is way. the sidekick. Yeah, he he's is. Fantastic. He's the sidekick um, Especially with, with a lot of attention voice. on him. What, Chris what, Tucker's what? super high, very strange voice was perfect for this role. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Especially since he was supposed to be this big ladies man. Yep. You know, with a voice sounds like he's permanently got helium inside of him so. well i think you have a sound clip for this one right oh uh, yeah Robert. yeah i got one for this one sir are you classified as human uh, negative i am a meat popsicle actually i have a second one too all right major dallas you've been selected for a mission of the utmost importance what mission save the world there you go yeah <laughs> well the first clip especially uh it's sort of like it's uh which I might have lost for words. It's typical of the dialogue in the movie. Right. It's that can't be stupid kind of stuff. Yeah. Big yeah. bada boom. A little quippiness, like when he goes and uh, how do you, you know, you mind if I negotiate? Then he goes and shoots eight guys. So it's how, how'd you, you know, how'd you learn to negotiate or, you know, et cetera. That kind of an idea. It's all about that little quippiness of, of this, uh, the back and forth. Yeah. Right. Um, though you, you forgot the most important actor out of all of this. Oh, Luke yeah. Perry. Oh, that's right. Yep. He's got a small part in the beginning of the movie as a yep. scientist assistant, basically. He was or, the uh, artist or whatnot. Yeah. Well, I don't remember yeah. that at all. Oh, well, it's because he's only in the movie for like maybe 10 minutes. Maybe. No, I don't even know if it's 10 minutes. It's probably two. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a Luke Beeson film, right? 
Uh, yes, okay. yes. Um, director of Taken, Transporter, other movies as well. Yep. But, yep. And then the final movie I had was The Expendables 2, which, like some of the other movies we talked about, isn't really a Bruce Willis movie, right? Uh, except for in the other movies we've talked about, Bruce Willis was in a much bigger part in those movies. He's in a small part here. But I thought I would point it out because it's sort of um, – it speaks about Bruce Willis and all these other actors in this movie. And Expendables 2 is really a, a study of a man's place in a world where machoism is sort of how one defines, you know, a man. And as you get older, it's harder to sort of, you know, maintain that level of machismo, if you will. But we're expected to. And so we see these Expendables 2 as these, you know, old aging action stars playing roles. And so I think it's a study of the human condition. I think it is an, an excellent example of a, of a fine piece of cinematic poetry. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sociological study of, you know, where do men fit in in society as they age? I think Steven's picture. I'm sorry. Crazy. I just, I blanked out in the middle of that <laughs> sentence. Uh... <laughs> it's how men identify themselves and you know it's a difficulty of men at this age to sort of carry on with the society's expectations to be tough action stars where in reality it's tough as you get older to do such things uh, well okay. you know you could have JV, jvcd if you want to see how you can do that in a different way uh the john claude or jcvd sorry the john claude van damme film where it stars john claude van damme as john claude van damme during a bank robbery Yes. It's actually yeah. fantastic. Yes. I want to see it, and, and I just have no way of watching it. I can't find it on – or no legal way of watching it. Yeah. I can't find it on Netflix or Amazon without uh, streaming. We may need to buy that film. Yeah. It's, he's so, supposed to have a really we good can do a monologue Jean at the end of yes. it. Jean-Claude Van Damme day. Yeah. He's got – Could do – Well, he would have nothing quotable whatsoever, but he's got some fun <laughs> films. Yeah. No, his Blood monologue sport. does work out well, because um, yeah. it is that is exactly the point that you were sort of BSing to up up to this yeah. point was yeah. the place in 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 society and so forth. But that's actually his monologue gets to a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what do you yeah. do when you're no longer celebrated for what you were celebrated for? You can't right. do what you were celebrated for. You know, what is your place? What did you have to sacrifice to get to that point? So it's actually quite good. I think yeah. I might film. have a church quote. Let's find out. Start pressing buttons. We're American, honey. Our names don't mean shit. I have no idea, but I think that was from the Expendables too. <laughs> I have no idea. Eh, they all said the sure. same. Well, if we'll play another play random well. one. Let's see what this is. All right. We're just gonna wait here for a little while until things quiet down, if you don't mind. No, that wasn't from the Expendables, but I have no idea what it was from. I think it might have been from the Fifth Element, but I could be wrong. It probably was. Yeah. Yeah. And I won't play the Armageddon quit clip because we've determined that we didn't have armageddon right and so with that he presses the button yeah uh, <laughs> no i have to switch <laughs> screens man no but i All think right. it takes to your point more broadly is that bruce has been the headliner on a lot of films right yeah um you know top of the billing and so forth he's also been a role player in a lot of films um he'll be walk on like oceans 12 where he plays himself you know, walking through the stuff. Uh, he has been uncredited in a lot of films because he just lends something to the different parts. Um, uh, so I think there's there's a lot to be said about his role, both as an actor and as a sort of a, a member of the community. Um, I think he's done a lot of positive things in terms of adding to movies across the board. And I don't think you can say that with a lot of stars. And so I actually... I really do respect him for that and makes, you know, the stuff that he does even more enjoyable. And he's gone a long way towards increasing the production of overpriced food served in a big blue ball. Well, there isn't a lot of competition for that, I will say. Um, but yes, Planet Hollywood, well done. <laughs> so here's to you, Bruce Willis. Yeah. I would tip something up. And yeah, no, I think Bruce is great, but but uh, I know Bruce, and uh, he's just no Bruce Campbell. You know, I don't know why you're turning off our newest fan by by insulting I know. Why him that are, way, Robert. Yeah, why are you you're alienating our listener? I am not alienating <laughs> our new listener. I'm I'm kissing up to our slightly longer, well-established listener. <laughs> 
Yes, we do have multiple Bruces who listen. So all of you who, listeners who are Bruce. named Bruce, who are not one of the two Bruces we've honored, we are happy to do a segment for you in the future. Uh, your name is Bruce. You get a segment. So yes. congratulations. And we have considered doing the film My Name is Bruce. We have. So we'll wedge it in between one excellent Rudger Hauer film and another excellent Rudger Hauer film. Oh, boy. So never. Okay, got it. <laughs> yes, excellent. Oh, uh, I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> That's a you pretty good take us out? then. Yeah, go take for it, Chris. Right. All right. Remember, boys and girls, whatever you do this week, just keep it awesome. The Hour of Awesome is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all the other Jester Cat shows at www.jestercat.com. You can also email the show at hoa at jestercat.com. Catch the show live Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern at www.jestercat.com slash TV. Follow the show on Twitter at Hour underscore Awesome. You can follow Robert at R.S. Macy. You can follow Stephen at S.E. Humphrey. And you can follow Chris at C.W. Culp. And thanks again to Scott Fletcher for the voiceovers. Go to voice.caroworks.com for more about Scott's great voiceover work.